Resuming debate, reprise de débat, the Honorable Member for Edmonton, Strathcona. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, it's my privilege to rise in support of the motion uh, by my colleague, a uh, very sensible one, and uh, by the nature of the issues that have been arising over the last couple of months, I think uh, well overdue. And I would be pleased as well, Mr. Speaker, to be sharing my time with the member from St. John's South, Mount Pearl. It is very clear, Mr. Speaker, that there is a need for an audit by the Auditor General. Uh, the government speaks in terms of its enforcement regime, its surveillance of the Temporary Foreign Workers Program, is spot audits commissioned by the companies themselves. Uh, not to throw any credibility questions into independent auditors they might hire, but I think that there's been enough public attention to this that it's time for the Auditor General to come in who does, as per usual, a fabulous job in auditing federal programs. So, Mr. Speaker, what are the issues that we have before us? Well, the first issue I would suggest is, do we even know if we have a labor shortage? Do we have a labor shortage for skilled workers, for service sector? Do we even have reliable data? Well, the response to that by some independent uh, bodies, including the Parliamentary Budget Officer and the C.D. Howe Institute are, no, we do not, in answer to those questions. The Parliamentary Budget Officer has reported that Canada has continued excess capacity in the Canadian labour market. They also reported that only modest growth in real average wages. They also reported that there is little evidence of a national labour shortage in Canada and that there is no evidence supporting an acute national skills mismatch, except in some specific areas, and they single out some of the sectors in Saskatchewan. They've also reported that there is lower job vacancy rates and higher unemployment. So obviously raising some serious issues about how the Temporary Foreign Worker Program is addressing uh, the supply of labour and addressing unemployment in Canada. The Parliamentary Budget Officer has reported that there is a skilled labour shortage of just 32 percent and un- or semi-skilled labour of 16 percent. The Parliamentary Budget Officer has suggested the higher proportion of temporary foreign workers in the private sector could be putting downward pressure on private sector job vacancy rates and reducing the number of job vacancies. So in other words, actually uh, imperiling the creation of jobs for Canadians, not, not filling those. Provincial data also suggests uh, no, pr no provinces are experiencing acute labour shortages or skills mismatch related to before the 2008-2005 recession. Well, Mr. Speaker, the C.D. Howe report concurs with the findings of the Parliamentary Budget Officer. They, they have found that there's little empirical evidence of shortages in many occupations, that the relaxation of conditions to hire temporary foreign workers had the result of rising unemployment in Alberta and British Columbia. The minimal uniform application fee, they suggest, paid by employers to hire temporary foreign workers offers minimal incentives to seek Canadian workers to fill vacancies. They also found that other countries impose substantially higher fees uh, prorated per sector. So in other words, um, they've identified two problems. One is that you got a cross-the-board fee, and if you're dealing with a big sector like the fossil fuel sector, it's probably not a high enough fee to deter um, the hiring of a temporary foreign worker instead invest in training or to invest in searching for a Canadian employee. Uh, to quote uh, Professor Dominique Gross, who was the author of the C.D. Howe report, she states, a successful program would encourage employers to attract and train domestic workers for jobs that are permanent and that ensure stability of their business activity in the short term. The current Canadian program falls short of these goals. Mr. Speaker, do we have reliable labour and skills data? Well, the Parliamentary Budget Officer and C.D. Howe say no. Statistics Canada now also has said no. Why? Because the government, apparently in its wisdom, provided only sufficient dollars to survey employers on work demographics, skill shortage, hiring of temporary foreign workers, which position hard to fill and why, but no money to analyze the data and thereby inform the Canadian economy where there might be gaps and where we might need to be directing our training dollars, where whether we need to get support for mobility, and whether there might be space for temporary foreign workers. 
Even the minister, Mr. Speaker, has been quoted saying, we must do a better job of collecting detailed labor market information. Well, the budget was shrunk for such analyses, was cut by almost 30 million, and staff in Statistics Canada cut by over 18%. So we're not going to immediately address this problem. So what information have we gleaned? Has the temporary foreign worker program impacted wages? According to the information obtained by Access to Information, the answer to that is yes in Alberta. Across the board, it's been revealed in the service sector, laborers, restaurants, nurseries, farm workers, hotels, casinos, and gas stations, hundreds of unlawful temporary foreign worker permits were issued by this government at wages below the prevailing wage rate for each of those occupations. That, Mr. Speaker, indicates a pattern of using temporary foreign workers to drive down Canadian wages. This evidence merits broader, independent review by the Auditor General. The Minister has said, in quotes, he encourages, in quotes, employers to raise wages. Well, Mr. Speaker, I think perhaps the Minister has additional powers. He should be going beyond encouraging uh, Canadian employers to employ Canadians or to train them. This evidence suggests that his temporary foreign worker program is having the direct opposite effect. Thirdly, Mr. Speaker, what has been the effect of the temporary foreign worker program on employment by Canadians in the major employment sector, which this government likes to speak of all the time, the oil sands sector? Well, the first accelerated program, which was no LMO required to hire temporary foreign workers in, in Alberta, was finally ended. But it was replaced with a pilot program, in other words, no LMO required, and has been recently extended. Well, what has that caused? Well, as I have raised in this place on behalf of Canadian workers, in particular the iron workers, at, at least two major oil sands projects, Husky Energy and Imperial Oil, in the case of Imperial Oil, 65 Canadian iron workers were laid off and replaced by Croatian temporary foreign workers. In the case of Husky Energy, 300 Canadian workers were replaced by temporary foreign workers. In the case of Imperial Oil, I have actually been approached by a number of the workers who have been laid off, who have come to meet with me. One of them is a single mother apprentice. Now this government talks all the time how it's working hand in glove with major industry to encourage and support apprenticeships. And yet here we have a scenario where a single mother who has gone back to school and is apprenticing was laid off and Shame. replaced by a temporary foreign worker. And why is that serious? Because you need that work experience in order to get your, your ticket. Um, I also was approached by an Aboriginal apprentice who was laid off. And he has a young family and very seriously concerned about the lack of enforcement of this program in the oil sand sector. I've also been approached, Mr. Speaker, by steam fitters apprenticing at the SO Heavy Oil uh, sector in Cold Lake, where apparently eight out of three of the crew are temporary foreign workers despite the fact that there are many workers, including Albertans, who would like those jobs. The problem is uh, the sector is moving so fast that uh, the rental rates are skyrocketing. There simply isn't a place for people to stay, whereas we are enabling temporary foreign workers to come over. We pay their travel, and we, in some places, subsidize uh, their housing. I've heard from welders who can't get work, who have been waiting for a year where jobs are posted and are not taken up. Uh, I heard from an insulator where 200 jobs were posted and then removed. And they were then told by the company that they were applying for an LMO to fill those jobs. So, Mr. Speaker, where is the oversight? Where is the inspection? Where is the enforcement? Where is the enforcement and compliance strategy? I raise this issue repeatedly with this government. Uh, an efficacious regulatory program includes good regulations and rules, an inspector, a fully trained inspectorate who will ensure those rules are enforced, and an enforcement and compliance strategy that sets forth how exactly they're going to ensure that this program is complied with. Well, we are told there is no on-the-ground surveillance program for this sector. So the obvious question is raised. There's a lot of talk about increased penalties. How on earth are they going to assert these penalties when the only time that violations are raised is when workers who are displaced either come to the official opposition or other opposition members or to the media. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I welcome questions.
questions and comments, Kestoni come on tied. The Honorable Member for Winnipeg. The Honorable Member for Sewers, Moose Mountain. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. And I've listened to this member, and she started her comments by saying, do we know if we have a labor shortage? And I think the implication is that the program should either be discontinued or not there at all. And I would ask her what she might have to say to uh, uh, the Chambers of Commerce uh, and the various members of the Chamber of Commerce in, in areas like Surus Moose Mountain, uh, where they are not able to fill positions. The one city has over 400 unfilled positions, Estevan over 1,000 and some unfilled positions. Places like Moosom and Saskatchewan that cannot uh, attract people to fill many of the food and service industries uh, that are in dire need uh, of, of people and where they would hire anyone that uh, they might uh, that might want a job in that industry, but they have used those and still can't fill them. There are uh, facilities that have not opened or cannot remain open to the degree that uh, people would like the service simply because they can't fill uh, those jobs. And to say that we don't know if we have a labor shortage in certain areas of the country, in particular uh, Sewers Moose Mountain, it's a very important program and there are significant shortages. And what would you say to those uh, members? The Honourable Member for Edmonton Strathcona. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, well, if the Honourable Member had listened closely, he would have heard that I not just once but twice mentioned that there may be some exceptions where uh, we need to uh, be emphasizing there may be a need for temporary foreign workers. I mentioned this province of Saskatchewan twice. Um, the bigger question is, is the government basing its decisions on whether to issue an LMO simply because the company says this is the going rate and this is what we're going to pay our service workers or say our oil and gas workers? In the case of Alberta, it's been discovered that, in fact, they have been undercutting salaries and the government has been inappropriately issuing LMOs and driving down the salaries. So there can be many reasons for a labor shortage. Maybe there aren't appropriate salaries. Maybe there's not appropriate housing and people don't want to relocate. There are a lot of issues. And of course, we've raised the issue of a shortage of affordable housing in this country. Um, I think that exactly the issues that the member are raising are exactly what we'd like the Auditor General to take a look at. Where exactly are there labor shortages? Do we have enough data on that? Do we need to be supporting uh, Stats Can to start actually analyzing this data? Where are the problems with this, with this uh, temporary foreign worker program? Questions and comments? The Honourable Member for Winnipeg North. Yes, uh, Mr. Speaker, I'd like to pick up on the member's last reference in terms of the Auditor General here in Canada and, and just raise it in the sense that uh, because of the abuse that has taken place within the program over the last uh, number of years, uh, that especially given the, the heightened attention uh, that the issue has been given uh, here in recent uh, months, uh, that there is, in fact, uh, a general lack of, of confidence that many uh, Canadians have in terms of the temporary foreign uh, worker program. And one of the ways to, to resolve, uh, to deal with that particular issue is, in fact, uh, to turn to a body that Canadians have a deep amount of respect for, that being the Auditor General's office in, in Canada, and to ask her if she would not agree uh, by having the Auditor General uh, directly involved by reviewing the program and uh, coming up with the recommendations as to how the program uh, can be uh, fixed, if that is indeed uh, the best way of trying to, uh, to fix this particular uh, problem. The Honourable Member for Edmonton Strathcona. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, clearly, I agree because that is precisely what uh, our motion is, and that is to call on the Auditor General to uh, take a look, have a program audit of the entire temporary foreign worker program. But there is more the government can do as well, in tandem and in parallel with the work of the Auditor General. For example, they can actually genuinely step up an enforcement regime. I mean, there is actually no on-the-ground surveillance regime for this temporary foreign worker program. The government simply sits back and waits for a complaint. Um, I'm informed that they actually brought the border guards in to deal with, uh, with McDonald's, which is pretty <laughs> incredible. So, well, there's a lot of talk about the penalties. What we don't have is we don't have an inspectorate under this program, under, uh, under labor, under immigration, wherever they want to have it. And uh, people who are fully trained and deployed full-time into the regions where there are 
uh, major numbers of temporary foreign workers. So, yes, there's a lot that can be done. We fully support, obviously, the audit by the Auditor General, but there's a lot that this government can do. Um, it is the government's responsibility to deliver a credible program that does not prejudice Canadian workers.